we're trying to do an exhaustive study of Torah study. We're trying to understand what's it all about, what's the purpose of it. There has been an obsession uh, from time immemorial in the Jewish communities about Torah study. It's the pastime of the Jewish people. It's what we admire, what we look up to, the great Torah scholars. We're told that this is the one mitzvah, the one Torah commandment that supersedes all of them. And the question that we started our journey with was why? Why has there been such an obsession, an interest, a, a dogged determination and tenacity to maintain not just observance of Torah, but Torah study? Uh, and the goal is to find uh, some of the classical reasons that are given uh, to this question. And then once we kind of have the understanding as to why we're so interested in Torah study, we'll actually dig into some of the details of what it is, what is the composition of the various documentations, what is the evidence, what, what do we know, what don't we know, and what can we find out. Um, so this is part eight. I don't keep in track. I, ha- I am. Part eight of why we study Torah, and we're up to reason number 14, and I hope to do 14 at least through 17 today. Okay, so we find something really interesting, and this may be a little bit surprising as well. We find the claim that study of Torah, mere engaging in the pursuit of learning, of studying, of acquiring knowledge of Torah, will help someone fix their character. Now, if you are a veteran of going to torch classes and Torah classes, you'll know that the holy grail of our religion, so to speak, right? The, you know, the, the, the creme de la creme, the, the highest level you can reach is that of character perfection. We're told a grand picture of our uh, Weltanschauung is that we're here, we're placed in this world with severe character flaws in the form of a body that's trying to push us away from God, in the form of characteristics that are antithetical and anathema to the Jewish way of life. And we have the Torah, the Torah and the Jewish vision to try to help us rectify that. The mitzvahs were only given to us, we're told in the Talmud, litzarif es habrios, to purify the people. If you were to kind of map out what is the beginning of a life and what ought to be the complete perfection and conclusion of a life, it would, you, it would start off that you start off life being imperfect with lots of problems, lots of character maladies, and over the course of your life, you improve, you get better, you perfect, and eventually, hopefully, before we kick the bucket, we're perfect. Now, as a consolation here, Almost no one actually gets to become perfect. You know, Moshe, Moses, Abraham, these are the names of Rabbi Akiva, people that are, you know, that are perfect. But we're trying to do as much as we can. We're trying to perfect to the degree that we're able to. And we're told, and I think this is very striking, that study of Torah brings us perfection. And the question is why? You know, I'm, I'm coming here with a claim that when you study ancient documents, the Torah, uh, the Jews date it to the year... Uh, 1312 before the Common Era. So we're talking about a document that is 3,300 years old. Not only that, the Jews claim that it even precedes that time. Abraham had access to the Torah 500 years prior. And we're claiming that study of, of, of said document and its associated documents, in the form of the Talmud, the Mechilta that was mentioned earlier, Sefer Sefer Mechilta, the Torah's Kodim, etc., the Mishnah, all the books of, that comprise the Jewish corpus, we're claiming that these, that the, just the mere study of this brings us to character perfection. The question is how? What about Torah study enables me or compels me or forces me to become a better person, to become a better spouse, to become a better friend, to become a better colleague? The, 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 those themes don't seem to have any overlap. You say, well, you could broaden your intellectual horizons. If you said that, I would say, fine, that makes sense. Yeah, of course, you study Torah. It's very mentally challenging, especially if you dip your toe into the ocean of the Talmud. It's exceedingly challenging. Right? You have to really put a lot of mental stress. Maimonides writes that he would, when he would study, he would think so hard that his head hurt. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. You become uh, uh, intellectually uh, more acute, more aware, more capable. Fine. Character? Become a more patient person. Become a more giving person someone who's less likely to get angry or to be impatient through Torah study? How does that work? 
So I have a few theories I'll share with you guys, and we'll see how that goes. We're told about Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is one of the great heroes in Jewish history. He was someone who began his life as a Nidorebis. He's the son of a convert, so he's an outsider. At the age of 40, he had yet to learn how to read Hebrew. And he has this epiphany at the age of 40, and he decides to dedicate the rest of his life to Torah study. And he lives a very long time afterwards. He's been way over 100 by the time that he died. Actually, he was killed in, a, uh, in martyrdom. And he becomes the preeminent sage of his time and of his era. And what's the story that kicks off his transformation into someone who is obsessed with Torah? We find out in the Midrash, he goes to the well. He was a shepherd, of course, like all great Jewish leaders, Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and of course, King David. They're all shepherds, and that's an interesting thing for maybe a different time. He's, taking his, he's going to the, to the well, and he finds something very bizarre at the well. He sees that uh, there is a hole in one of the rocks. And he asks the people, why is there a hole in the rock? You see a rock with a hole in it. You know, there's before jackhammers that would yeah. do that, right? So he asked the people, they say, hey, look, there's a little trickle of water that is hitting that exact spot, and it's eroding the rock over many, many years of incessant, like non-stopping dripping of this water onto the rock. It caused, eventually, to bore a hole through. And this story caused Rabbi Akiva to you know, change his life. How so? He said like this, water is soft. Water that's soft is able to penetrate even a rock that's hard. How much more so can Torah, which is hard, penetrate my heart, which is soft? And he was determined to go study. The next day he went to study, learned, learned the Aleph Bet. He learned how to read Hebrew. Eventually he started reading the Chumash and the Mishnah and the Talmud, and he became and flourished into the great scholar that changed the world. And we find that in the times of Trajan, one of the great villains in Jewish history, so Trajan becomes the Roman emperor in the year 98 of the Common Era, and until his death in the year 117, when an equally villainous uh, individual becomes emperor, that would be Hadrian. So Trajan causes the rabbis to go underground. And we find episodes in the Talmud where the rabbis, because if they were studying Torah publicly, they'd be executed in a horrible, gruesome, barbaric fashion like the Romans are wont to do. So the rabbis are underground. In fact, they're actually not underground. They're overground. They're hiding in a loft in the city of Lud. And it's a debate. And what's the debate about between the rabbis? The debate is, what is greater? Torah study or Torah actions? Talmud study... Talmud is the word for study as well. The, the book that we have called the Talmud is named after the pursuit or the activity that we do with the Talmud. Right? Talmud means to study. Is that greater? Or ma'aseh, action. Is that greater? Second mitzvahs, when you say action. Yeah, mitzvahs. Yeah, actions. And it's a debate. And comes along Rabbi Ishmael, who was Rabbi Akiva's colleague, and he's in the attic hiding from the Romans, and he says, action is greater. Comes along Rabbi Akiva, and he says, study is greater. And finally, everyone agreed, after, after some intense deliberation, everyone agreed that study is greater, because study brings about action. And to me, this was striking. Rabbi Akiva is the one who changed his life because he saw the water penetrate the rock. And he says, if water penetrates the rock, certainly Torah will penetrate my heart. To me, this is a model of Torah study. Torah study is not about the acquisition of information. A computer does that. When you study mathematics, you do that. Torah study is about allowing God to change your heart, to break through the barriers that are keeping us away from God and to penetrate that rock and to change who we are. That's what Rabbi Akiva's insight was. That was the, that's the lesson. It's the lesson is about how we study Torah, what the to, to study of Torah is. It's about changing who you are. It's about allowing yourself to be penetrated. 
And then, therefore, Rabbi Akiva is the one who says, no, Torah study is greater. Because Torah study, by definition, de facto, will change your behavior as well. Maybe in a vacuum, indeed, you're right. Maybe in a vacuum, an action is better than study. But we don't live in a vacuum. Because when you study Torah, especially in the lens, with the perspective of what Rabbi Akiva taught us, you're not just acquiring knowledge. You're allowing your heart to be penetrated. And once your heart's penetrated, well, once it's an internal uh, revolution that you have, you're, ch- you're a changed man, of course that will translate into actions. So when I make this bold claim that study of Torah is going to change our behavior, on one hand you can say, well, m- maybe it won't. And you know what? You'd be right. Because it's possible for us to study Torah and study Torah like we study mathematics. Right? Or like we study philosophy. Or we study English. Or we study any one of the other domains of knowledge out there. It's possible. But if we study like Rabbi Akiva taught us, if we study by allowing ourselves to be influenced and affected by what the Torah has, then by definition we'll change our behavior. So you have two people studying on the same bench. One of them is studying like Rabbi Akiva taught. And the next day you see their behavior and say, this is not someone who I met yesterday. This is, this is a different person. Torah changed that person. And you could see. And I'll tell you the truth, guys. I'll tell you a little something personal. I've met people in my life, especially in the great yeshivas in Israel, and it's astonishing. It's astonishing because you and I are not used to meeting people that are totally bereft of any negative character. Everyone you know, you'll say, yeah, he's a good guy, but I saw him do this or say that or think that or intimate that. Everyone we know is like that. You know why? Because we're all humans. But it's possible for us to cleanse ourselves, to be t- totally perfect. And, and it's astonishing. And where does that come from? How does someone change like that? We, we, how does that happen? Is this a human? Yes, they're a human. A human influenced by Torah. And I think, that, like to us, of course this is very demanding. But at least the knowledge of what we have when we talk about the Torah even if we don't take the lessons to heart, and we never study Torah, even if we don't, we should know why there has been such a, a dedication to the upkeep, the maintenance of the Torah. The Torah is this potion, it's this elixir that could change who we are. Nothing else has the power. All the great people that you know, right, all the greatest people that you can think of, there's something that you, know, that you, that you could poke holes in their character. Sometimes you, 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 know, you hear about someone, oh, what a great guy, and then you read the Wikipedia page and you say, like, you know, this scandal, whoa, what happened? You know, because that's where we are. Humans, you know, that we're... Was, we're tr- that was before I read this. <laughs> well, the, we're troubled. We're troubled species. It's very hard for us to rid ourselves of any negative character or behavior. Certainly negative thought, ne- ne- negative speech. It's not possible for us unless we use what the divine enabled us to. Yes? There's a... Yes. Yes, I've heard of him. He made a study about uh, in, in school of people that repeat every day the Ten Commandments. There's a lot of don't. And it proved those that repeat the Ten Commandments daily start to behave much better. Yeah, he wrote. He wrote. A, he wrote a great book. Um, uh, it was a clever title. Irrational. Irrational. Exactly. Uh, what's it called? Something irrational. Irrational. Uh, something like that. Exactly. Yeah, irrational something. Yes, so interesting. So he said he actually said that people that are involved in faith are, 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 what, are more likely to be... Act more morally. Yeah, more, more moral. Well, better. yeah, but to me, the, that wouldn't be as big of an insight because, yes, I, I, but I think if, if, if you and I were to speculate, people that are more faith, they have a sensitivity towards that, you would assume that they're going to have higher moral character. But to me, I think there's something here even more, and that is perfection. What we call in Hebrew, shleimut. In Hebrew, it's perfection. And I met people like that, and it's, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. And I think that that is a power that we can tap into um, with Torah study. And I think that on kind of the very high end of the spectrum, when we talk about Torah perfecting character, 
we're talking about this. We're talking about the Rabbi Akiva model of allowing Torah to totally transform who we are as humans. Go ahead. Well, uh, didn't Rabbi Akiva go away for 25 years just to study Rabbi Akiva, went, Rabbi Akiva went for 24 years. Just That's right. To study just to Torah. study Torah. He immersed himself entirely in Torah study. All right, the story how goes. Do we, how do we get immersed like that? Okay, so that's uh, that, that's hard. I would say that maybe what you quit your job in a general monastery and you study. Well, no, I well, 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 no, but as we recently can't. we can't. Well, as recently, I mean, we, uh, yeah, you're right. So we're, none of us are going to be like Rabbi Akiva. I I I would agree to that statement. Um, but there is uh, various levels of dedication. I'll give you an example. In uh, 1936. Uh, one of the great uh, 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 Torah uh, pedagogues um, passed away. He was my grandfather's teacher. His name is Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz. And he was someone that, at, uh, you know, after he got married, he went off to yeshiva for eight months. So that also sounds like a lot. I have a hard time going to yeshiva for eight hours. You know? But he, uh, you know, this, was, this is modern times. He left his family and he went to immerse himself in Torah for eight months. So we have examples of this even in modern times. We even have uh, an example, maybe even a little bit more kind of manageable, or even the idea of people going to study in yeshiva and not ever leaving the room, only leaving the room, only leaving the facilities for Shabbos. So you're studying Torah, okay, nine o'clock you go home, right? No, no, I'm staying there. If I'm tired, I'll put my head down on my Gemara and I'll sleep. So I'll sleep till 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 twelve, and then I keep on going. If I need another nap before Shabbos, I'll stay there, you know, and, uh, and I'll have another nap, and and just like that. And we know people like that. My grandfather wrote in one of his books about someone that he know like he knew like that, in very contemporary times. So obviously, the, even those things are beyond us. But I think, you know, I I teach all kinds of people, and I see people when I'm teaching Torah. Uh, we're talking about Torah issues in, in a class, and they're on their phone. They can't, you they, right? They're like, like this. They always do it under, under as if I can't see. <laughs> what they don't realize is when I'm talking, I'm so hypersensitive. I'm like, mon- I'm like gauging everyone. It's like as if doing like this, is not, I'm not going to notice right, it. Yeah. Uh, you know, putting their hands, putting their phone in their hands, like under the table, as if I'm, uh, you know, well. So it's like uh, we used to be like uh, kids in, 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 day, in day school, like, Trying to eat like in class when it was not allowed, and trying to hunt your head like this, and you know, yeah, go ahead. When you say studying the Torah, you're not talking about the Talmud. I'm, well, I'm talking well, about the Talmud. Well, I, I think it's uh, Rabbi Kiva. Obviously, is going to demonstrate. If we want to hear more about Rabbi Kiva, it's a different story. I gave a lecture about him recently, a biographical sketch of Rabbi Kiva, in the aforementioned podcast. You could find it. A very, very exhaust, not exhaustive, because there's a lot of. Talmudic uh, uh, accounts, uh, biographical accounts of Rabbi Akiva. But what I try to do is collect all uh, the major biographical narratives of Rabbi Akiva and kind of string them together in, chron- in chronological order and pull out the lessons and what the kind of mm-hmm. character profile that were being built for him. So uh, you can listen to it over there. So is it about the Talmudic study? So yes, yeah, so it, Rabbi Akiva obviously demonstrated a proficiency and an interest and an immersion in, in the very depths of the Torah. Uh, in fact, we even have stories or uh, dialogues that he's having with other scholars in the Gemara and Sanhedrin. The Gemara tells us that Rabbi Kiva once commented on Agadita. Agadita is what we would say is maybe the easier parts of the Talmud. It's the parts of the Talmud that's ethics. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's not the most mentally demanding uh, parts of the Talmud. And one of his colleagues says to him, Akiva, what are you doing studying Aradata? Right? Klach lecha, it's a, it's a uh, kalayim va'olos. Why do, why do you study this easy stuff? Go study the hard stuff, the kalayim and olos, these very complex laws of, of the transmission of, of impurity in the form of, of, of vessels and enclosures. Very complicated stuff. Unlike, you know, he was an expert at all the nitty-gritty stuff that people are even scared to dip their toe into. Didn't Akiva live before the Talmud was written? Well, I'm saying the Talmud was written, but it was, it, it was a body that was unwritten that was maintained in an oral fashion prior to that as well. Uh, but this was ready. Rabbi Akiva existed. He, uh, he lived kind of... It means the, the, the sections of the Mishnah 
according to some opinions, were even made by Rabbi Akiva. Kind of the organizing the Mishnah into different parts, into the 63 different books that we have today. 60 was made into 63, um, but there is an opinion that says that Rabbi Akiva himself was the one of the people that kind of took all of the collected uh, teachings of the Torah and the Talmud and organized them into different groupings. Um, so yes, yeah, so the idea of different parts of the Talmud was already, uh, uh, was already uh, in, in his time. So yes, to answer your question, Howard, Torah is Torah. Torah is the will of God, irrespective of, uh, or the brain of God even, irrespective of which angle of Torah you're getting, right? But reading the Chumash is not... Right, so reading the Chumash is you're kind of steaming on the surface. Uh, but learning the Chumash and asking questions and taking the verse in the Chumash and saying, I want to find five questions to try to really understand, and using that methodology to try to dig deeper mm-hmm. and to try to build some sort of insight out of a verse, uh, that I think is is challenging and does kind of force you to stimulate your, your mind and think and work things out. Of course, you study Talmud, then it's, you're forced to do it. Yeah. There's no way to s- skim around some, some Talmud. But even Talmud, there's very d- different levels of, 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 of depth that you could try to plunge into. Uh, Rabbi Kiva was someone, once we're talking about him, right? He was someone who left no stone unturned. In fact, when the Talmud gives him a eulogy, which, by the way, gives you a little bit of a sense of the role and the impact and the legacy of Rabbi Akiva, when the Talmud itself eulogizes him in multi- uh, twice. And it says, when Rabbi Akiva died, it's a very short eulogy. When Rabbi Akiva died, Batel Kavod HaTorah, or Batel Kavod HaTorah, in the Sephardi or Israeli Havara. It means that the honor of Torah ceased when Rabbi Kiva died. Ceased? Ceased, that's it. No one else would really study Torah with the requisite honor. Why? Because Rabbi Kiva had this sensibility that every single letter is there because God wanted it to be there. If so, every letter has to have meaning. So that when the, when the Midrash even describes how he would study, he would say, he would say Aleph zu lama nichtav, this Aleph, this letter, why is it written? Like he, would, he wouldn't stop at anything. And the Gemara tells us that he was the one who says, every time it says the word et in the Torah, well, et is a word that we don't have a corollary in English, but et is as common as the word and and the in Hebrew. Every et in the Torah, he was able to understand why, this, why was this word et had to be written down. So, then, so that is the honor of Torah. It means even if you start from the verse, but if you start with the same attitude of every single thing matters more than anything else we could ever imagine... You'll get there. Yes. So, so Rabbi Ben, was he the one that really started that type of study of the Torah? Uh, no, he just he, 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 he exemplified it more than anyone else. Um, and of course, I'm saying that that's just the one thing that is uh, kind of harped on multiple times uh, about him. So therefore, it's obviously part of his, uh, you know, part of what made him special. Uh, of course, he, he was magnificent in every area of Torah, Obviously, he was he was the greatest uh, of his era, and in fact, he is the one of the crucial links that you know perpetuated Torah to us to this day. You know, if Rabbi Kiva wasn't around, it's very likely that none of us would be in this room studying Torah. You know why? Because Torah might have ceased, and if Torah ceases, you know what else ceases? The Jewish people. The Jewish people. You cut off the Jews from Torah. You cut off the Jews from existence, and that has been demonstrated again and again. So Rabbi Kiva and, and his students and the sacrifices and the commitments that they had to Torah that they made, they ensured that we exist as Jews in 2016 uh, in the United States of America. In fact, back to the Romans, the Romans and Hadrian made very uh, debilitating restrictions upon Torah study, and Rabbi Kiva kept on teaching irrespective of the fact that it put his life in danger. You know, imagine if they made a decree in the United States, God forbid, if they made a decree, anyone who studies Torah publicly will be executed. And when the Romans execute you, they don't just put a bullet in your head. Yeah, right? the There's going to be torture upon torture. And the Talmud tells that Rabbi Eliezer said, if I was around, I could suffer the death, but I, w- I, w- I would succumb to the torture. Because they were experts at making you so miserable in such pain and such torture beyond what you could even imagine. And we have some stories like that in the Talmud. 
Uh, and Rabbi Kiva says, I don't care what they're going to say. I'm starting teaching Torah publicly. A great personal peril. And someone said to him, Rabbi Kiva, you're going to teach Torah, Torah publicly? How are you going to do that? They'll, they'll kill you. Right? Go into hiding. What are you thinking? So Rabbi Kiva tells another funny story. There was once a fox, and the fox is walking uh, by the riverside. And he sees a pool of fish inside the water, and they're kind of hiding and dodging from corner to corner. And the fox asks the fish, why are you guys, what are you, why are you so dodgy? What are you worried about? And he said to him, we're trying to avoid and evade the nets. People string out nets. They don't want to capture us. And we want to avoid them. So we're always dodging and hiding from them. So the foxes have a great idea, brilliant insight. When you come on land, there's no nets on the land, you'll be safe. So the fish responds, you, Mr. Fox, you're what they say is the most clever animal out there? You're a fool. If I'm in danger in the place of my life, how much more so will I be in danger in the place of my death? Says Rabbi Kiva, yes, there are nets out here. Yes, it's dangerous for us to teach Torah publicly. But what if we don't? What if we jump out the water? What happens if we're dead? And indeed, he was captured, and of course, he was uh, executed in a terrible, horrible fashion. Uh, fashion. And he, and h- him and his sacrifices and his students and their sacrifices, they ensured that the Torah will go on. Uh, and that's because they had this perspective. Rabbi Kiva, so you want to hear more about it? Uh, I just spoke about it recently. Okay, so let's get back to the topic at hand. We are trying to laud and gain an appreciation of the value of Torah study. And we are claiming that Torah study is going to change our behavior, it will fix our character, it will improve our character traits. And we said the reason why is because Rabbi Kiva, on the kind of the very high end, he is going to, he's showed us how Torah penetrates our hearts and therefore changes our essence and, of course, that's manifest in our behavior. I have another reason, another argument to be made here. And that's like this. What's the one thing that happens when you sit down in front of a a book of Torah, maybe let's change this example. You're by yourself and you're inspired. You say, Oh, Rabbi Wolby said, You better study Torah. It's very important. He gave eight lectures on it already. I'm going to listen to him. So you say, Okay, you go through your bookshelves and you find a copy of the Torah or maybe a copy of the Talmud. I'm going to study this. You bring it to your desk, you open it up. What happens right then? You know what happens right then? Something is, is there's an ignition that's turned on. You know? And that's Yetzahara. It says, like, this ain't happening. Suddenly your phone, like, did I get any messages? I turn your phone. I'm like, um, you get kind of hungry. I'm kind of hungry. I'm going to go fix myself something to eat, right? Right? And then it's, it's, ooh, it's hot here. You open the window. Like, and before you know it, it's, been, it's an hour later and you haven't actually studied. So you study a little bit, like, you can't do it, right? It is overwhelming, but what does it demand? To actually study Torah, it demands more than anything a self-control. It demands that we resist all those other distractions that are designed to make us abandon the Torah study. That's what it demands. Study of Torah builds our willpower. Willpower is the capacity to resist and say no to all the distractions in the world. You know, what defines people that are successful? People that are go-getters. People that follow their dreams. Why? Everyone has dreams. How come some people follow and fulfill them and some of them don't? The answer is because they had willpower. They just muscled their way and they failed. So what? They didn't stop. This capacity of having willpower, of having, being in control of your destiny of having to be able to actualize your dreams, that is what you need to study Torah. So conversely, if you study Torah, you are becoming someone who is resisting to the distractions and building your willpower. 
Torah equals self-control. Self-control and thus willpower. And you know what happens if you have willpower? What else do you have? That's, this is what we call a gateway midah. What, what we call, what I call, it's a gateway. You know why? If you have willpower, you essentially have everything else. If you have willpower, and obviously predicated on the fact that you have determinate that you have interest, right? But willpower is the engine, it's the fuel that gives you whatever else you want. So you are conflicted because you have, I don't know, problems being you know, mild-mannered when you're hungry, which is a problem that some people, particularly of the masculine orientation, have. Right? That's a bad mida. That's a bad characteristic. And your goal in life is to fix and to change that. So you're hungry. Food's not, food's, food's not ready. You know, and you feel something being awakened and suddenly you start screaming at your kids or your coworker or whatever or you're driving like a maniac. Right? That, that happens. Right? But if you have willpower, you say, no, I'm going to behave like a mensch until I get what I need, until I'm pacified and mollified and assuaged, and taken care of. That is because you have willpower, then, therefore you'll, you'll have that as well. So you'll, you'll gain patience, you'll gain the capacity to uh, resist anger. All the other good midos are byproducts of willpower. And we get willpower with Torah study. And I'll give you guys an example of someone who had this philosophy. And I've said this story before because it's my favorite story. So if you heard it before... I apologize. I assure you, I've said it more times than you've heard it. Even though I'm not sure anyone here has heard it. But I think my brother plagiarized it, so maybe you guys have. <laughs> so this is the story of Rabbi Israel Salanter. Rabbi Israel Salanter, uh, arguably the most influential Jewish rabbi of the 19th century. And certainly of Musser, right? Uh, 1817 to 1883. In 1857, he moved to Germany which is the equivalent of someone uh, leaving Bnei Brak, which is the epicenter of Torah in the world, and moving to like the red light district in Amsterdam. Uh, leaving Lithuania in 1857 and moving to Germany. But either way, he is obviously very famous for his genius and his Torah greatness, but also for kicking off a movement to try to stem the tide of assimilation into marriage and regression that was happening in the 19th century. The 19th century was uh, probably, arguably, the worst century in terms of adva- advancement of the Jewish cause, of progression towards the Jewish destiny, maybe of all time. It was that bad. Well, maybe you can make the argument that the first century was worse. You lose a temple and you have schisms and all that. The 20th century wasn't so good either. Uh, it wasn't, but we see already the ember, it, the, the, the process of rebuilding that's been underway. So yes, I, I, I would certainly make the argument uh, that the 19th was worse than the 20th. Um, in terms of progression of the Jewish ideology, of course, a lot of tragedies happened in the 20th century that are unparalleled by any atrocities and by any genocides in all of human history, certainly. Uh, either way, Rabbi Israel Salanter was a smoker. And you say, Rabbi, this is, uh, this is someone who is an ethicist. This is someone who does Musar. How do you smoke? Where's the self-control? Good question. And it's been asked before. So you're not the first oh, to ask the question. Century, didn't know the damage True. 1964, 1964 is when the Surgeon General came out with a warning uh, that smoking cigarettes will give you cancer. Or potentially, right? And by the way, the great Torah scholars that used to smoke... Many of them, not all of them, but many of them that day never smoked another cigarette in their lives. <coughs> Willpower, right? So Rabbi Israel Salanta was a smoker. And I, I've never smoked, but my dad used to be a smoker. And one thing I know is that a smoker, when they need a cigarette, they need a cigarette, right? And there was one time, middle of the night, that he woke up and he needed more than anything else. He needed a cigarette. And there was only one problem. The problem was, he didn't have any cigarettes. Well, if it was Shabbat, it wouldn't be so much of a problem. He didn't have any cigarettes. And the only place that sold cigarettes in the middle of the night was a mile walk. Why you say walk? Why not take the car? Before cars were invented. So he's faced with a dilemma. He has two options. Either he goes back to sleep because he's tired in the middle of the night, right? 
Or he gets up and gets dressed, then walks the mile and gets the cigarettes. Which option do you think he chose? Now think about it. Imagine you're a great Torah scholar and your life's goal is to perfect your character. Which goal do you choose? Do you go back to sleep? Do you go get the cigarettes? Unless they went for the cigarettes, even though it doesn't seem reasonable. I don't think anyone should get cigarettes. You've heard the question before. Yeah, what do you say, Steve? Only two people have heard it before, so we're good. What do you think he did? You know, you go back to sleep or not? There won't be any story if he did. Uh, he to so you say what they got to say. Right? <laughs> Let me tell you what he did. And listen to this calculation. Listen to this calculation. Just the calculation itself. If this is all you got out of tonight, this is like worth it because this is Judaism, right? This is it. He said like this: If I go back to sleep, what am I doing? I'm giving it to my laziness. I'm too lazy to walk. I'm tired. I'm lazy. I'm cranky. I'm reinforcing. I'm empowering my laziness. Well, what happened? I'm giving in, right? I'm, I'm a loser, right? I'm, I'm lazy. Laziness is one of the negative characters I'm put on this earth to combat. So I can't go back to sleep. What happens if I walk there and get the cigarettes? Well, then I'm not lazy, but I am someone who is following my pursuit of pleasure. I'm becoming some... Huh? He lost it, but he doesn't do it. Booyah. Oh. And I don't want to be someone who is, who, who is so committed and so indebted and so beholden to their desire for this pleasure. So I'm in a rock and I'm between a rock and a hard place. You know what he did? He didn't go to sleep. He's not lazy. He went there. He didn't buy the cigarettes. He's not committed to his pleasure seeking, he went back and went back to sleep. That's the attitude of Judaism. You're here, not to make yourself miserable, because that's what it might sound like, right? Why would you do that, right? It's to make your body miserable, right? By empowering your soul. He wasn't as addicted as you think. Well, maybe he was. Because remember, these are smoke without the filters then. No, like they, this, is, this is willpower. This is the ultimate This willpower. is willpower. That's right. Yeah. You, you gain the reins to your life when you take it away from all your whims, from all your little petty desires. That's when you're in control. That's what it means to have willpower. You're in control. I'm tired of going to sleep. I'm lazy. I don't do something. My laziness is in control. I'm not in control. I, every, every time I need something, I want something, I feel like I have to have something, I go off to go run away right away and run, away, run and get it, that's in control, not me. I resist. I fight back. I say no, I gain control, I gain the reins. So you go to sleep when you're not tired? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Well, you're trying to understand it, but the point is, is that you are fighting against all the whims. We're placed in an environment, in the circumstances, where we're being pulled every which way. Especially, you sit down in front of studying Torah. You sit down in front of the book, and you're being pulled left, right, and center. Oh, I didn't call my mom in so long, right? That always happens. Oh, maybe I should check out what she's doing, right? Excuse me. Right, it's, exactly. You, you were just giving into it just because your kind of body and your bodily centric whims, they don't want you studying Torah. So suddenly all the, and all the, of course you should call your mom, right? Honor your parents, right? But, but who wants you to call your mom and who doesn't want you to call your mom right now? Of course you should call your mom. That's not my point, right? And if, mom, if you're listening to this, I apologize. <laughs> Um, right? Of course you should call your mom, but when you are placed in front of your Torah, there are going to, it, it's a battle. It's a battle. And the battle is every second there's going to be something else placed in front of you and says, okay, do this instead. The ultimate antidote to your Yetzirah, says the Talmud, is Torah study. Barasi Yetzirahara, Barasi Torah Talmud. I created a to- uh, Yetzirahara, uh, uh, evil inclination, I created the Torah as an antidote. That's it. Therefore, you're studying Torah, everything comes in your face. Right? Do you have the antidote? Will you have the Torah? Or will you lose this titanic <clears throat> battle that defines your life? And when we sit down and study Torah, right, we're resisting. And if we maintain our commitment to study Torah, we're resisting even more. 
we control ourselves, we study for four hours Torah straight, we're changing ourselves. And by the way, you want to have pain? Try doing that. You want to have real pain? Ooh, deep, intense pain. <laughs> Some people like that, right? The masochist, right? Try it. Try studying Torah for four hours straight with no distractions. No, don't, don't nod, no. Try it. Oh, I can't. Though. Well, you try. Of course you can. It would not be easy. It would not be easy, right? Sleepy right? or something would happen. And you get sleepy right away. By the way, that's, that's, why, that's why it's one of the best. If you ever like, uh, a, you have insomnia, all you got to do is pull out a big of Mishnahis and start reading. You'll be asleep before the end of the Mishnah, right? It's because uh, the Yetzirah wants you to be up and miserable tomorrow, but he does not want you to be studying Torah while you're up and miserable. So he says, uh, you'll, you'll be sleeping so fast before you can say, uh, before you can finish uh, the uh, session. But that, that, you know why it's so painful? Why it's so difficult? Why the Talmud says that Torah niknet bi surim, that the way to acquire Torah is with pain, with struggle, is because there's so much resistance. And therefore it demands control from us. And you know, but you know what happens? Well, what's the payoff? What if we do do it? What if we do engage and immerse ourselves in Torah study? Well, then we're building our self-control. And of all the good mitos, of all the good characteristics that you would want in life, you want more than anything else, you want the gateway characteristics. My grandfather used to say like this. Well, he would say in the name of his teacher, every day, try to find five times where you are resisting to the Yetzirah. Five times. You're studying Torah, right? Ooh, suddenly I'm thirsty. Ah, I'm going to go get a little water break, right? Let's wait five minutes. Let's resist a little bit. Let's have just this one little moment in our day where we say no. Oh, sorry, no. I, I want to take the reins. I want to study Torah now. Uh, water? Uh, well, that, let that wait. Doing that five times, you're building your resistance. It's like doing your push-ups, right? You, top five times a day, do push-ups, right? The doctor will tell you. Right? Go for a walk, you know? Do some exercise. You know? Don't just sit by the desk and just tired. That's bad for you, right? What's the spiritual exercise that will affect our entire lives? Very broad, far-reaching, positive influence and effects in our lives? The five spiritual exercises. And what's this one spiritual exercise we could do? Say no. Say no. Go ahead. One question. Is that why yeshivas became so popular? Because of Yetzirah? That they could study all together? That they weren't all Yeshivas as opposed to what? Yeshivas are always popular. Right. Yeshivas are not re- popular, popular only well, is now. That, is, that a, is that a definite reason why? That they well, have? It's, it's like why are hospitals popular? To take care of... Because people would die otherwise. Right. But they study together in yeshivas. They don't go a lot. That's right. We have to study Torah. And, and one of the reasons, by the way, why the Torah was maintained in its oral form was because if it was just everyone reading from the book, well, then you could... Do it by yourself, and then you lose the flavor of studying Torah in unison. The Ched Vasad Shmaitz, as what's called in the Talmud, or the pul, the Pilpul Chaveirim, which means the study and and bouncing ideas off of friends. Right, that you only get in, in such an environment. By, by the way, incidentally, the reason why the Torah, the Oral Torah, had to be written down. Because we had to find a way for people to be on their own studying Torah because studying Torah publicly was disallowed and because people were spread out across the globe. But the idea of having a central institution where everyone gets together and studies Torah, we have institutions like Sura and Pumpadisa. Have you ever heard those names? No. What does that sound like? Sura. It sounds like... Sewer. Uh, like a sewer? Well, what does Pumpadisa sound sounds like? like a section of the uh, Quran. Well, maybe, right? Well, the, the, these are places in Babylon. Well, in fact, there's the uh, a surah, a chapter of the, in this Quran is called the surah. All right, but surah is a city. There's a city called surah, a city called Pumbedisa. And these are famous in Jewish lore because they each had an, a, a, a yeshiva, a mis- what's called a masifta in, in, in Aramaic. And these yeshivas were institutions that were around for like 1,200 years. These were established 400 years before the Common Era, and they went until like the 10th century. Like these, these, these institutions were, were, uh, you know, were, were, were hallmarks of the Jewish world. 
the, the, you know, these were the epicenters of Jewish life for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years. You think of the great universities that we have in America, like they're 100 years old, 200 years old, 300 years old. Like Oxford's been around since like, I don't know, the 13th century, 14th century. These are institutions that were around for twice as long. You know, because we've always had a yeshiva. You know, we're told, um, and I mentioned this um, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if anyone remembers, but we're told that when the temple was destroyed, the Almighty only has a place, a domicile in this world in the form of the four cubits of Torah study. Where, where is the equivalent of the spiritual resting place of the, of the temple of yesteryear? Where is the equivalent today? The only place that we have is within the uh, boundaries of yeshivas, of Torah study, of, 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 of institutions that are dedicated to, uh, to Torah study. So yes, it's important to study Torah, but the, 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 the preferred format is in the form of yeshiva, yes. That's why yeshivas have been, always been popular. Um, in fact, I'll tell you something cool. We're told uh, in the Talmud, it might be a midrash, but those are sister books, that Avram Avinu, Abraham, our forefather, was a zakin v'yoshev b'yeshiva. Abraham was an old person, a retiree, and where did he go? Did he go to Scottsdale, to Miami? Where did he go? To Boca? He went to yeshiva. And Isaac, zakin v'yoshev b'yeshiva. An old person in yeshiva. And Yaakov Avinu, the great uh, Jacob, zakin v'yoshev b'yeshiva. This idea is central to Jewish life, that there has to be a place which is designated for Torah study. This is too important a pursuit to be done piecemeal, to be done to be done people on their own by themselves. Is yeshiva in the United States as good as yeshiva in Israel, or is it not the same? Well, it's interesting you ask that question because in, in the Talmud's times, remember, we have two coexisting Jewish centers. We have a Jewish center in Israel, a Jewish center in Babylon. In for a hundred, hundred, thousand, well, I guess about a thousand years, uh, and each one of them had their great institutions. Now in Babylon, they had the benefit of having relative peace and stability, uh, and Israel did not. Uh, but there is, interesting, we find in the Talmud several instances where there's rivalries. Why was it, you say? Well, because the Jews were living there. The Jews were exiled there, and only some Jews came back. And it was really good for the Jews in Babylon to stay there. And they said, okay, we'll come visit the temple in Jerusalem during the holidays, but otherwise we'll live here. Just like, you know, the same question I'll ask you, Howard, right? There's Jews living in Israel today, right? So, in a hundred years from now, our descendants are going to, or at least, uh, I don't know about our descendants, but uh, uh, people will look back and say, why were there so many Jews living in, in Houston or in the United States or in France or in England or in South Africa when they're, you could have gone back to Israel, right? It's a good question, and I don't know if we have a good answer, but it's kind of fun here. It's nice here. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's the United States. It's the, Was the yeshiva different here than it is there? Well... So I would say that while the Talmud seems to indicate that the yeshivas in Babylon were greater than the ones in Israel, uh, clearly the ones that are in Israel today are greater than the ones in the United States, both in sheer numbers, uh, but also in kind of the, quant- the quality. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you my experiences. I studied in both, in both variants. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the yeshiva is the yeshiva, right? It's a place where there's dedication to our study, uh, and that's, you know, the, the standards of scholarship that you find even in American yeshivas supersedes that of even the greatest uh, 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 secular institutions of learning, of higher learning that you'll find in the world, <coughs> hands down. And by the way, Mortimer Zuckerman, Zuckerman who is uh, the owner of uh, one of the biggest real estate companies in the world and the publisher of the U.S. News and World Report and the Daily News, uh, and one of the wealthiest Jews in the world, he was brought for a, uh, he, they brought him for a tour of the Lakewood Yeshiva, which is the biggest yeshiva in the world, uh, in, in the United States, um, Lakewood Yeshiva, and he said that I went to Harvard. And you know what? In Lakewood, New Jersey, where the Torah scholars are studying, there is a, a, a intellectual, um, I don't know the words that he actually said, but it's an intellectual achievement and pursuit that exceeds Harvard. So that's even in America, but in Israel, it, it, it's, it's orders of magnitude greater. I'll take you an example. 
We have, um, and with this, I will conclude because I'm going to keep, keep you guys that much over time. We have in the yeshiva cycle, yeshiva uh, schedule, this uh, fixed. Uh, there are fixed dates uh, of of break. So there's three weeks in the summer. Uh, there's three weeks, uh, four weeks for Pesach and three weeks for for Sukkot. And I was in yeshiva in Israel, and that's that's vacation, right? And there was a guy there who was studying. It was just someone who, like, he, I never saw him not studying. Also, someone with just, like, such wonderful characteristics. Like, I, this is someone that, like, I'm in a dormitory in the room. He's a room across the hall from me. Wonderful guy. Just always smiling, always positive. Nothing, like, nothing that you could find that is in any way a questionable behavior or character. He used to study, like, like... Like, you, like no one you've ever seen, right? And then he told me that, oh, during Benaz Manav, during the vacation time, he studies about eight to ten hours a day. I don't know anyone that studies eight hours a day during the regular, right? <laughs> I study eight hours a day. Like, somebody, we have a hard time studying for an hour. Well, we studied 15 hours during Yeah, like this is, this is a different realm, and we live in it today. You could still go, and I would advise, if you have an opportunity to make your way into yeshiva of any sort, you might feel weird because the guys all look like they're dressed like clones. They're all wearing white, black and white. And why are they all wearing the same clothing? And what's the deal? That's a good question for a different time, right? But to just get a sense of the pursuit of truth and the rigorous debate that you find in a yeshiva that you don't find anywhere else. You don't find anywhere else. This, the, the passion and, and, and the, the, the determination that these young scholars engage uh, with uh, uh, in pursuit of Torah is unrivaled to anything else you'll see in the world. And just to get that experience, to, 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 to expose yourself to, to, you know, to, to realities that are unparalleled. You know, we live in a world, young people especially, they're so flaky, right? You know that. You guys know that. I didn't tell you that. They're always in their phone. You can't concentrate. You can't talk. They're always playing video games. What happened? Like, where's all this brains being directed at? And it's... And then you see people, their peers, so to speak, their equals in the yeshiva. And you say, oh, why don't they go to the army? That's a good question. We could talk about that. Why do they go to the army? That's a good question. You know, but to just get a sense of what you know, what, what it looks like when someone is able to direct their energies, their, their intelligence to Torah and, and, and kind of see the flourishing of the human mind. It's just, it's just remarkable. Uh, either way, I think that the Torah is going to link us up to God. We get linked up to God. We get better behavior. We get better character. And that is indeed our pursuit. And the way we do that is via Torah study. Once again, I'll say this again, I'll say it in the future, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If we had any doubt as to the supremacy of Torah study, as to why is there such an obsession, after eight lectures, as to why we study Torah, I think we're getting closer to the answer. I, and I think it, it is all that it's shaken out to be, and we still have more reasons, and, and God willing, we will do that next week. Everyone have a nice Purim. This was delightful. And maybe let's try challenging ourselves by ourselves. It's much easier in a classroom, right? In a classroom setting. Try to take a book on your own and spend an hour or two hours doing it. It is painful, but is very, very rewarding. All the best, guys. I'll see you Friday. Yes. Let's make it. Yes. Let's recommend to study the prophets. Something easy. I would try to find. 